Now, I know what you're thinking. Anthony, 100% coverage is unrealistic, and why would you suggest this? And Hold on a sec. I'm not talking about 100% test coverage. I'm talking about 100% test coverage in tests. And I'm going to show you why that's important uh, and some stuff that I found at work and a procedure that I used at work to figure out that uh, some things are not as they seem. Anyway, let's jump into it. Okay, so um, the, the spoiler to this whole thing is the important reason to enforce 100% test coverage in the test files themselves, as well as any testing only utilities, such as little helpers or assertion methods or that sort of stuff, is it helps you f ensure that your tests are actually running. And uh, there are s quite a few ways that you could accidentally not run some tests in Python. Uh, in particular, the most common ones are either naming or you got the wrong syntax or the wrong file name or you put the test in the wrong spot. Uh, all of those are reasons that tests may not be running. And one easy way to ensure that you never do this is to just force 100% test coverage in the test files. Not talking about the actual code itself. That's a whole different thing. Um, and actually, personally, I do like 100% test coverage in the actual code, but I'm, I'm not going to push that. <laughs> I'm not going to push that religion on anyone else. Uh, okay, but I wanted to walk you through how I figured out some problems at work and how I, you know, debugged what was going on and ultimately fixed some of the problems. Some of them are still there, unfortunately, and I'll have to either I will have to fix them at a future date or someone else who actually owns the code will. All right. Anyway, so the first thing that I wanted to do is actually collect all of the coverage data at Sentry. Uh, now, Sentry owns a coverage startup called CodeCov, and CodeCov does aggregate all of the coverage data. Um, and despite working with the CodeCov team, their pages load way too slow to actually do the analysis that I needed. So I decided to combine the coverage data myself and use the tools that I'm familiar with. So I'm going to walk you through how I did that. The first thing that I did is made a little patch to actually upload the coverage data uh, so that I could use it offline and combine it all and, and do the analysis that I needed offline. Um, zoomed out a little bit, let's zoom it in. Uh, basically, we run tests with coverage. They output a dot coverage file when they run, and I just used GitHub artifacts to scoop those up, and then later I can combine them all. Um, so that's really all this patch does. Uh, I also needed to fix a typo so that the actual Python tests ran, because <laughs> otherwise they get skipped. And so this, I mean, maybe I should commit this to the main branch, but uh, the typo was, was actually load bearing here. Okay, cool. Um, blah, blah, blah. And then I wrote down this procedure. Uh, basically, I ran this PR. Uh, it produced a bunch of artifacts, and you can see those. Look in. Oh, no. Problem with zooming in. <laughs> if we look here and then go to summary and then scroll down and ignore all of the warnings, uh, GitHub will list all of the artifacts for a particular workflow file here. I have already clicked all of these. I have already downloaded them. Uh, they are all here. Uh, I'll have to delete this one or other ones. Um, so I've already done that. I've already downloaded those. Cool. We're on to the next step. Um, move them to a directory. I used dot slash cov. I have also already cloned Sentry, and I'm going to check out the revision of the PR in a second so that we have the correct code matching locally to what was run in the PR. If there's a code mismatch, the coverage data will produce complete nonsense, so it's very important to make sure that those two match. Um, all right, make their cov, and then copy all of the zips to here. But we have this one that's not like the others. This one's also not like the others, but that's it's a special snowflake test suite. Okay, cool. Uh, unzip them all. I wrote this little one-liner. Yes, I shouldn't use ls in a shell script, but uh, we're hacking stuff together, so this is fine. You ignore all the warnings. I didn't make it perfect, but I did make it produce. All of the coverage files. Hooray, these are all the coverage files. I also made sure that they were named properly so that when coverage combines them later, um, it happens to match this particular naming convention. Uh, I do remember the old naming convention used to be an underscore here, so at some point it changed to a dot. I don't know why. Uh, we also have these weird ones here. I think these were coverage data from some subprocess. <clears throat> Unclear. Don't know why they're there, but apparently not important. Uh, okay, anyway, 
Uh, unzipped all of them, apply a patch. Uh, this patch does two things. The first is, I gotta zoom back in. Uh, the first is it, it sets coverage paths source to this uh, value here. This is important when you run coverage combine on data that's produced from a different file system. So in GitHub Actions, the code is checked out at this location. However, uh, when I check it out locally, it's at dot. <laughs> so we're gonna apply this patch um, and we'll also apply this patch. This will come into play later and actually it alludes to the last part of the video where I'm gonna talk about, well, what are the problems with actually trying to do this? What are the things I'm going to run into that are going to make this a pain in the butt to do? And this is actually one of the things, which is that tests that are skipped are obviously not going to be covered. Uh, and similarly with X failed tests, they're probably going to fail somewhere in the middle and not cover the rest of them. And so this is one way to just say, hey, uh, hey, coverage, I don't care about skip tests. Just ignore the body of those and continue on with it. Oops. Knocking stuff over. I'm too excited, waggling my hands around. Okay. So let's apply this patch and continue on with this step-by-step -step instructions that I uh, conveniently gave myself because I knew I was going to make a YouTube video about this. All right, we have this patch applied. Oh, but I forgot an important step, which is to actually check out the revision that we care about. Um, yeah, I forgot to do step two. Okay, let's do step two. So the easiest way to figure out the revision, well, there's actually an easier way with fancy Git refs and stuff. Um, but what I usually do is I go to the checkout sec uh, checkout step in GitHub Actions, and it will tell you parameters, blah, blah, blah. And then somewhere in here, it will tell you the Git revision. Yes, this is the Git revision. And so if we do Git fetch origin this, uh, we should be able to get that and then check out fetch head. And if we do get rev parse head, you can see that that is the same as the one we found. And if we get log, it should be a merge commit. Uh, basically, GitHub Actions performs a merge before running your tests just to make sure that you know, as it runs the tests, your branch might be old, but let's update it to the latest revision of your primary branch or the merge target and make sure that those changes are all included. Uh, basically a, a very simple measure to make the code less audited. Okay, anyway, we've checked out this particular revision. Uh, what's the next step? Apply the patch, cool. Uh, combine the coverage into the root of the repository. So uh, rm.coverage star, there shouldn't actually be any here, so I'm gonna do dash f, actually do with a semicolon, because uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't actually run this command. <laughs> I think I just wrote this into the issues, so it's not quite correct. Okay, so we're going to copy all of the coverage files into our current working directory, and then we're going to run coverage combine. Uh, this is part of coverage pi, uh, which I have installed beforehand. Head bat coverage pi, uh, just pip install coverage. Um, I've actually met that. Uh, I've met Ned in person. Uh, Ned is a wonderful human being. Um, okay, anyway, so run this, and it's going to take a while. Keeping duplicate file. Okay, yeah, this was one of the weird files that we didn't know really was going on. So, I guess coverage has special code for skipping duplicate data. Great. Okay, we've combined all of our coverage data. Now what? Now we can use coverage report to look at various parts of our test suite or of, of any of the code really. Um, in my particular case, I wanted to look at the tests. So I ran coverage report include test slash star star. I don't need, know if the second star is needed, but it doesn't hurt to add it if we're doing, uh, you know, depending on the clock system, uh, you need more, fewer or more stars. And this is taking forever. Why is this taking so long? Um, well, it did end up completing. And this is actually very useful information. So if we look at this output here, you'll notice that we have a bunch of files that are 0% covered in these tests tools directory. Now this is actually just an artifact of the data collection. These tests are actually running as part of a separate suite, but only when those files get modified. So we can ignore those. Uh, but you'll notice some of these other files have not 100% test coverage. And I was interested in some of those, uh, and so I, dug into these, they should be basically 100% covered. Um, some of these smaller ones are not for various reasons. Let's actually look at one of the ones that's uh, not 100% covered, uh, such as 
this one here. Uh, lines 25 to 32 and 1039. So if we open that up, look at line 25, make 24H stats. I bet this function isn't used at all. Uh, we have we have a weird theme from my last stream. Yeah, this function is completely dead. So in theory, you can just delete this 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 uh, function. It's code that's dead and not not really doing anything. Let's look at 103.9. I guess this is always true or, or or never run. So this this line is uncovered. And, and stuff like this is just dormant code that's sitting around in your test suite. I did want to find one that's a defensive assertion since those are also going to get called out. Line was that one. 43. Uh, well, this is just more dead code. Anyway, <clears throat> the point is, sometimes you're going to find stuff that's just never called. This group uh, cache property, never called. Uh, this code can be completely deleted, and the test will still pass. And the cool thing about dead code when you're running your tests is you know for you know utmost certainty that it's never covered. Because if your tests, <laughs> if it's test code and it's not covered, it's very safe to delete. Uh, now, I did want to look at one of these bigger files. Oh, uh, no, not that one. Where's the one? Well, I have it here. Uh, let's run this command. Oh, not that. Copy without shift. It's in browsers, it does different things. Okay, so we have, uh, we already looked at this file. We have this test sessions v2 file. And you'll notice that there's a lot of ranges that are missing here. 395 to 422. Let's just start with that one. If we open up this file, 399. It looks like a normal test to me, right? Right? Well, it would be a normal test if it were this indentation. <laughs> However, uh, the author of this test mistakenly indented it, and so it was just chilling out in the body of this other test, and obviously it's never going to run uh, while hanging out there, because it's literally just a function hanging out there. And if you had enforced 100% test coverage, this, this mistake would have never made it through a pull request. It would have been found out in, uh, as you're making your patch, coverage would have been like, none of these lines are covered. Uh, engineer probably would have scratched their head and been like, aha, it's indented, so I can't run them. Um, and so this is just like one example of why coverage can be really, really helpful and, and useful to enforce inside your test suite. Now, unfortunately, I tried to dedent all of these, and uh, <laughs> they don't pass. Surprise. Uh, and that's because they've been dormant for, I guess, you know, five or four four years at this point. So, uh, yeah, that'll be for someone else to fix. Uh, so, oh, I didn't show the other file. There's another file that's also kind of interesting here. Um, but I don't remember what it's called. It was one of the ones that's a lot lower than 100%. I want to say it was an API. Uh, oh. oh, no, it was. Yeah, this one. Um, so this is, this is also an interesting one. Uh, oh, actually, this is just dead code. This metric sessions v2 test, never used. So that wasn't, oh. anyway, there was another test where the class was decorated with a context manager and the context manager uh, does not decorate classes, it decorates functions. And so the entire class was just never being run. Uh, and switching it, what the original author intended was to decorate it with a mock, which you can actually decorate an entire class. And that would have. Okay, so the last part of this is uh, hey, you know, this all sounds good. I can find code that's not running. I can find tests that are dead. I can find things that are named improperly, indented wrong, wrong file name, etc. This all sounds good, but what's the catch? And the catch is that your test suites are not always often as homogenous or completely run like this. Um, you'll notice, you know, we already touched on the first part of this, which is, uh, you know, lines that are skipped or X failed. Uh, you know, skip tests are never going to be covered, and so they're always going to be a false positive in this. Um, so how do we change the coverage system to be a little bit more lenient on, uh, on, on code like this such that we can actually realistically get this to on? And my answer to this is to just use a tool that I wrote called CovDefaults. <laughs> 
Now, obviously, these two aren't in cover defaults, which is why I put them here. Um, but the idea behind cover defaults is it configures coverage in a way that gives you a bunch of useful defaults out of the box that help you uh, help you you know do this. Um, and I, I've kind of split them up into a couple of things. The first are um, a bunch of excluded lines uh, for things that are going to be defensive code. So, for instance, if you have a testing helper and somewhere in there you've identified a test problem and you want to raise an assertion error, uh, it's probably a good thing that that assertion is never hit. And so you can just ignore that particular line from coverage. Uh, and so you know, this provides several ways to ignore particular lines from coverage. Uh, coverage also has a special comment pragma called pragma no cover. And um, I don't remember why mine is more strict, but apparently it's more strict. <laughs> uh, but this, this allows you to uh, ignore particular lines by commenting them with a particular line of code. Uh, here's a few other you know, typing related things or um, command line tools and other things. Now, uh, another thing that comes up pretty often is platform specific coverage code and um, or, or version specific coverage code, which are really what these things are here. Uh, oh, this is for branches anyway. Um, but, but trust, we'll talk about this in a bit. Platform specific code. So I've also sort of invented a new form of this no cover comment, which allows you to tag a particular no cover with uh, platform specific code. And just to give you an example of this in pre-commit, uh, pragma, I probably have a Windows one. Uh, I mark them as Win32? Yeah. Let's specifically do it in tests just to show you some stuff here. So uh, if we look at our, uh, let's look at the Python test. Uh, there's some code in my test suite here that particularly uses a different set of paths on Windows. Wow, this is a really old test for Python 3.4. <laughs> uh, that uses a different set of paths dependent on the platform it's on. And so naively, if you were to run this on Linux, uh, the Windows lines would never get hit. And so uh, this pragma can help you mark code that is platform specific. And arguably, I just I should just make cover defaults look for this, and then simpler. But that's oops, that's that's a different thing. Uh, but anyway, I can mark this particular line of code with the particular uh, pragma cover or no cover comment, and then uh, this tells the coverage system, hey, on Windows these lines are going to be hit, on Linux these lines are going to be hit. So ignore them on the opposite platform. And basically, with, with those strategies, uh, special no cover comments and ignoring a bunch of common defensive code, it's a lot easier to get to 100% test coverage in your tests. And then you can have all the benefits of being able to identify you know, silly indented tests or dead code or uh, dead functions, dead helper functions, and clean up your test suite and feel much better about your tests actually running. Uh, actually running. Yeah. Just, just period. Anyway, hopefully you found this useful, uh, and I have a lot of things to fix at work to, to make sure that all of our tests are actually running and we can start enforcing this. Um, but anyway, hope you found this useful. Additional questions, leave them below or reach out to me on the other platforms. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.